Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jess. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Mind Warp, also known as Brain Slasher, which came out in 1991, maybe 1992, written by John Brancato and Michael Ferris and directed by Steve Barnett. Well, Gary, what's the synopsis? Well, the story follows Judy, played by Marta Martin, who has had enough of living in an AI-ruled utopia and gets exiled into a post-apocalyptic wasteland where she encounters Stover, played by Bruce Campbell, and together they fight to survive against the radiation and the mutant cannibals who dwell underground. In the future, life will be a dream, and reality... A nightmare. Hook into the happiness system. Relax. Imagine. Enjoy. Hook in. Bullshit. So this was uh, made and financed by Fangoria magazine in the early 90s. You know, at this point, it was already a well-established and successful cult horror magazine. And so they decided that they were going to finance and release one movie, one horror movie, every year, ongoing. Sadly, they only got around to making three movies, and this was the second one, even though it was actually the first one that they shot. The others, including Severed Ties and Children of the Night, both of which I have not really ever come across. No, I mean, I feel like it was a, it was a failed experiment, but, you know, that's not to say it wasn't worth trying, and this film... Is all right. I mean, to broadly speak, this is a film you may have not heard about. Um, it was before it's Bruce a Campbell. Low budget, one yeah. under a million dollar budget, and I think this film has only sort of risen to the surface because of the name star in the film. Yeah, well, Bruce Campbell's career kind of was still on the rise at this point. Yeah, and even though his more, you know, his. This is, opus. this is just a couple of, of years before Army of Darkness. Yeah. So yeah, like Evil Dead was definitely a known. You know, video nasty. It, people were aware of it, but Bruce Campbell as a as a leading B movie star was yeah he, exactly he was just on the cusp of of what yeah. we would know. Yeah, I mean the, he he's gone gone on to make a lot better B movies, I suppose. Would be the for way sure, to put it. for sure. Um, some great horror films, obviously you all know and love. But um, in this particular case, it has a fairly star studded cast in Campbell and in. Angus Scrim. Absolutely. Angus Scrim is also an icon of horror. He is the tall man from the Phantasm series of films. Absolutely iconic. Wonderful guy. You know, he loves his horror fans. He loves the horror conventions. You know, and he's been so supportive of Don Cascarelli and, you know, and all on all of his films. And, you know, just such an awesome presence on screen. Literally terrifying, but at the same time, really humble and really kind. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it's... um good that he t- he went ahead into this because again it gives us a, another little glimpse into kind of uh, an, an idea that I think went on to do be, how maybe was seen by somebody and went on to do something better um, it is very Matrix driven this film oh absolutely it's kind of cyberpunk sci-fi horror thriller post apocalyptic yeah. so it takes a lot of boxes right off the get go but you assume it's post apocalyptic i mean when the there's film a few opens little... up with a nuclear explosion <laughs> yeah you assume but you don't know because it's a computer saying it and then a girl screams at it and then we're all just like what the hell oh, god and, yeah. and it's a bit weird because the, the central actress is not amazing i mean she's not again she's not hammy it too badly she staggers through this film sort of i think it's not she's not she's not very good in this but then again i'll also say that the script and the dialogue is not very good in this no no <laughs> which, which amazes me considering some of the writers for this film went on to write um the game with but, michael douglas which is fantastic the effects aren't great either but the team that went on to do the effects have gone on to do amazing things like you said oh yeah this is a kmb effects company so you know it, it's uh kurtzman nicotero and berger the kmb effects group done some of the my, my favorite special effects in movies um but yeah like i said very low budget so they had they didn't have too much to work yeah, with i mean yeah that's the other thing you can say it again about the script well not even the script and the effects because of the budget, but because these guys were starting out to some extent. So they're always going to be a bit 
questionable when there are earlier attempts to get it right. Well, we kind say. of see like very minimal kind of set dressing. It also looks, I want to say it looks very 70s, especially when we see their, their pods or their beds that they use to plug into Infinisynth. Which is, you know, this, this, it, you know, we know it as the Matrix, pretty much. And they even have the same kind of jacks in the back of their necks. Uh, but you can actually see, like, the plugs or the pins that they use to connect. It's very yeah, retro looking. Very analog and stuff. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, again, like we said, it's the budget. But it's, again, not bad makeup on the neck. Yeah, it's it looks, really good. It looks good. Um, the whole film has a low budget feel to it. Without good, It's hard to, I mean, we can pick, there's not that much to explore beyond, um, she gets cross with the machine at the very. Do you, do you want to do a Yeah, sure. I mean, she, well, I, I, she gets very annoyed yeah. with. She she doesn't cool. like the AI. She doesn't like the virtual reality. She sure. wants to live. She wants to go and explore. She's tired of just staying in this bed, getting up, eating this disgusting looking green goop, and then you know going to the bathroom and then jacking back into the into the matrix. Just, that yeah. is their entire existence, and she's tired of it. And she also you know she's. She's complaining that her father's disappeared. She's complaining to her mother who just enjoys this existence. And we get... A sweet but her we... mother forgets her name. And there is a kind of idea that this is all a dark dream that is designed to uh, nullify mankind's kind of... Existence. Yeah. Completely. I mean, like, from from the opening with the nuke drop, we, we get the impression that the entire world is a wasteland. And, is in... and this yeah. is now a safe, the only way humans can exist. And forget the horribleness that is outside. And it does reference the matrix. I think you could, you could well be right about the matrix re- reference because the um it, this whole premise does come back to the key element of the matrix, which is red pill, blue pill. Imperfection is the way the architect designed the matrix. Yes, and. She desires imperfection. She doesn't want a perfect yeah. dream. She wants an imperfect Because with nightmare. this matrix, everyone <laughs> is aware that it is a matrix. They're aware that they're jacking into it. And it's creating their own personalized dreams and experiences. And so with, with her Judy getting upset with her mother, she jacks into her mother's matrix and sees her performing this opera. And I have to say, like, the set dressing here is 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 ugly. It's horrible. You're like, this is the Matrix? Mm. This is the best you can do? <laughs> like, yeah. where's the grand auditorium? Well, the, you know, the, the, bu- the budget was clearly dying <laughs> quietly. Because this is the problem. This film. It's got a big vision. Um, it's ambitious, It's ambitious. Sure. But the problem, as we said, is this, the budget's so low. And maybe the vision wasn't quite crystallised. The writing scripting wasn't quite on point and the whole film we, we could nitpick the whole film to pieces like this because it is or incredibly straight to dvd slash vhs for sure for sure it is uh, not a masterpiece by any stretch of <laughs> oh, no no and again that's the thing it's you know um as you go through it you meet a very small cast yeah, well, I mean, there's not many speaking roles in the film. No, I mean, it is certain, a wasteland. In certain creditations on like online, they don't even mention the mother's um, actress, and and that kind of gives you the idea that she was okay. She quite literally spent has one dialogue interaction and an opera sequence in uh, sequence, and then you just see her sleeping for the rest of the film. Well, she she ends up getting pushed off the stage, or I think she pushes her daughter and then falls off the stage and dies. And then they crown her the new opera, you know, singer and give her the flowers. She wakes up from the Matrix and realizes that her mother is dead. So I guess if you die in the Infinisynth, you die for real. And, you know, and she, she's all upset, but then she's also really angry with the AI. And then we see the goon squad come in and they put her in a white bag and they burn her access card. And then she wakes up buried in the wasteland. You know, she's looking around and we've got these these skeletal figures, you know, on crucifixes with their robes kind of blowing in the wind. And you're just like, wow, OK, well, is this what you wanted? Like, I'm thinking the Matrix seems like a better a better thing right now. Yeah, I mean, and then you go off onto her. Um... Well, she ends up wandering through and the then, desert. Yeah, she, she ends up stuck in, stuck in quicksand. Then she gets Then she gets rescued by... no, no, slash she gets cap- captured yeah, by, by, by the mutants who try to feed her a severed arm. And then they gag her, which, you know, like after all the screaming, it's like, okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then all the meantime, you see another figure heading that way because he's heard the screaming in it of 
Bruce Campbell's character comes to the rescue. Yeah, he's armed um, with a crossbow. He yeah. takes one of them out. Then he takes the other one out. But then the other one was still alive. So he ends up stabbing him with his sword that he dropped in the, the frozen lake. <laughs> yeah, and then he finally rescues her and then takes her back to his... Cabin in the woods. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then he just in they have a discussion about the end of the world. Like he's one of the survivors from the up world, and she's an in worlder, and... a dreamer. I think they call them. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, and well, it's kind of like that. That's it's, it's very it's more almost like... montage. Yeah, where no, and it does feel like he's time feeding her as well. ferret and yeah. and uh, and feeding her. Like, you see him. He's capturing these animals in the wild and, and feeding them and you know they're basically just building the characters they're building the relationship and you know and it's not five minutes before they're in bed together yeah and it, it's it's a very hg wells up world the down world and morlock or morlocks and stuff i mean that there, there's a, there's some other tones to the film with that um kind of a dark future where people have evolved into two species again it doesn't really explore it very much beyond like having it, it didn't need to it's it's yeah, it couldn't do it. I mean, that that, that that's a, a more brutal statement. I mean, it's just like it couldn't do it. it, it what, what it wanted to do wasn't possible within uh, their budgetary yeah. slash probably experience levels because it, it, this is an indie project to some level. I think, yeah, and it feels well, that for a sticking million. to uh, cliches, you don't have sex in horror movies. The 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 cannibalistic mutants burst through a hole in the in the ground through the wall of the bedroom and drag them both down this death slide down into their their crypt. Yeah, that was weird. I mean, again, it was a kind of shortcut to kind of. Get get them to where they needed to go. The script yeah. just decided to. Well, this is where the entire rest of the film now takes place uh, in this underground dwelling, and you know, there's we do get introduced to Cornelia and a character called Claude. Claude seems to have like radiation burns on yeah. her face, and she also is a mute. And Cornelia just seems like this deranged woman who's living amongst these mutants, who ends up tying Judy to this hammock. You know, dressed in very little, and we have these mutants watching her, and I'm like, is this going to get rapey? Is are they going to be impregnating her to continue the mutant well, species? Well, shadow that a little bit, but the seer um, is their leader, and he appears at this point. Yes. Yeah, and it's obviously uh, it's all a bit contrived. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I this is where again I'll just point out the the the, the, the set dressing is very iffy all around. I really point. I thought that they did a fantastic job with this underground setting, especially with the lighting and the, light, and the cinematography sure. in this minimized set. I just loved all the junk and the debris everywhere. I thought it I thought it was really quite effective like compared to some of the other sets. I thought this one really well, worked. Well, the art world sets, I thought the best the best set is probably the crucifixions where Bruce Campbell, we didn't explain that at the very beginning, but Bruce Campbell's family are all like crucified because when he, he stops... buried them the mutants ate their corpses yeah so he he always puts them above ground but now they're even easier to see i know well, I guess... <laughs> and, they've, and all the skin's been taken off them so you're like how long ago was it did the cannibal still manage to get the skin well no off them i assume anyway? it's like he puts them up in the midsummer where the radiation just burns them to ash fair it's like a cremation <laughs> over a week it still didn't make too much sense to me i'm like th th how Easily did these underground cannibals find their buried corpses? Well, there's a lot. There's a lot of little things in this that try. They try to make nuanced points on. Like at the very beginning, we forgot to mention there is a black cylinder she knocks over off the mantelpiece when she's listening to some of her dad's music. Yeah, yeah, and with, with a classic kind of CD player, um, <laughs> which is a nice retro point. Future the, tech. Yeah, the, yeah. So a bit, bit wonderfully retro for its time. Um, and she's sitting there with his card. So these things all come back to kind of um, horn you because she's flashing his car his card around until, at this point, the evil seer isn't as evil as she thought. As she kind of like he sacrifices someone else in a place, and then well, he he's absolutely you know evil into that regard where he ends up taking Claude because he wants to punish Cornelia, and uh, and we have this massive ritualistic kind of sacrificing in order to make this to fill this bloodbath to feed the cannibals and you know and i wasn't expecting claude to die like she still feels like a very you know young teenager a child you know in, in its innocence well it was very much like a daughter to mother 
interact yes. between the two cults. Between women. Cornelia and Claude, yeah. yeah. But it was the fact that he gouges out her eyeball and then throws her on this, this ramp of rollers down to this giant meat grinder, you know, and blood spraying everywhere. You see this tiny faucet of blood with a, coming out and then it fills the entire bathtub and they start drinking out of, of skulls. I was like, this is awesome. <laughs> like, it's really graphic it, it and gory. Their, it but... is their blowout sequence, yes. as it were. To, and it is, I, I don't know, it just feels weird. Because the problem is the whole thing kind of just leads to it so abruptly. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Horror moment. <laughs> and we're moving on. It's just like, it, that's the film in a nutshell, because it does feel like it's on fast forward to kind of... Oh, yeah, um, the, the pacing is really quick. I mean, it's an hour, 30 minutes, and... You know, it, the the film doesn't pause for too long. It you know, it's always building up to the next. That beat. is to its credit. I think it it has a very sharp kind of lean script. Yes. I mean, whether or not. Well, there's well this because there's not that much dialogue. There's not many speaking characters because none of the mutants speak. We have the seer, Cornelia, and Judy, and Stover, and and those are the only real speaking characters. And we do also follow Stover as, you know, he's uh, he's been put to work uh, by the cannibals. And then implanted. And, uh, and you know, th- there is a very cool moment where uh, he sees one of the other mutants has had their hand severed. And he kind of looks at his hand for a moment. I'm like, it's oh, very evil dead too. <laughs> uh, but he ends up kind of plotting his own escape. You know, the cannibals are forced to find these artifacts, uh, these items from history, these techno- you know, bits of technology. They get taken to the seer and, and Stover finds a blender and he manages to remove the blade from, from it and uses it to, uh, to, to, to start his escape. He even calls to some of the other cannibals that are also forced to work like, hey, we're going to get out of here. Are you with me? And they're just like, nope. No, 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 no. Well, because he's the waste supposedly drive you insane, and that's yeah. kind of where they are, and they probably are going insane. Well, yeah, probably. But he he does end up launching his escape. He ends up slitting the throat of one of them. He ends up fighting um, a couple of other mutants. He ends up grabbing a, like a hook, wedging it through one of their heads. He ends up disemboweling one of them, and all of his guts spew out all over the face of another fallen. I'm just like, this is bloody and gory, and I'm. I'm enjoying the gore levels here. <laughs> but he does end up getting captured again. And then he ends up getting dropped into this, like, slightly submerged cage, which we'd seen earlier. The leeches, or these these creatures that live in the water, that get into... They burrow into you through any open orifice on your body, and they make their way up to your brain where they implant eggs... Which then controls you or turns you into these mutants or... Or drives you crazy. Or drives you crazy or at least subservient to the But seer. then again, the wastes drive you crazy as well. So it's yeah. all, And they're out in the wastes and it's all vague at this point. It's not like it's overly um, descriptive at any point. No, you're kind of left guessing what is what the methods are, it's, what they're doing. Yeah. Um, Until we get the big reveal that the seer, when he takes his mask off and reveals to Judy... That he is her father, and that he was exiled from Infinisynth, and that he wanted, you know, when he was brought to, when he was brought underground by these cannibals, he shown them the way. <laughs> yeah, he sort of now leads them as their cult leader, and he's evil, and he's trying to make a better world, but he's doing it through all the wrong ways. It's uh, <laughs> the misguided villains trope a little bit, I guess. Yeah. But then things get really creepy because he's like, here, here's our birthing chamber. Here's this pregnant woman. None of the cannibals can conceive. Cornelia is barren. So, daughter, I'm going to impregnate you now. It's like, what? Yeah, it's all, that, like we said, it gets rapey eventually. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And a bit weird. Um, but of course she refuses. She's like, you're going to have to, one of us is going to be dead before that ever happens. And he's like, well, okay, well, if that's not going to happen, then I guess I'm going to throw you down into the, into the, the grinder as well. You and I still have a chance. And you even have a choice. A life with me and my chambers ruling beside me. Or remaining here with her, like her. Either way, you will bear my children. No! Oh. I know, it's, uh, and okay. then, well, 
Yeah, and well, then she doesn't she ends accept up, that deal. Well, she, well, of course she doesn't. Well, she ends up getting thrown down. I think Stover throws her the baseball bat, or she gets hold of the baseball bat, and she wedges it in the meat grinder. And I was like, wait a minute. That's a wooden baseball bat. We've seen we've seen humans go in there, and like, there's not even bones coming out. They get comp- okay, film. Okay, fine, fine. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, she ends up suspended there, while Stover ends up trying to uh, to rescue her and free her again. Yeah, because um, Bruce Campbell's heroic efforts. So, and again, but he's going crazy. I think it's at least hinted he's starting to go crazy at this point. Yes, yeah. Well, he she he was rescued by her when she managed to free herself before yes. she got put into the grinder. And um, she had she does have her a bit of agency in this, but uh, it all just I don't know. I'm, I'm not, I mean, this is where it kind of loses me because it was just like. Uh, it's, again, the, the logistics of what's going on start to kind of lose itself in terms of um, the set design. I think uh, this is where I criticise set design. It feels too cl- small. I mean, that's cool and claustro- claustrophobic aspects, but like we said, the wooden baseball bat stopping the grinder and all that. And it, essentially, at this point, you you it's the heroic throwdown. She eventually, uh, you know, they eventually get a father into the meat grinder, and she kind of murders her own father. And then they try to escape to the upworld. Well, yeah, well, it's because Bruce... she realizes that that Stover has gone completely crazy, and he's yes. like, "You can't leave. You're you're now the ruler. You're the new seer." Because they're like, all no, they're no, all cheering no. her on. And Cla- I think Claude has been killed in the crossfire at this point because she's she hates uh, both. You know, Claude was thrown in the grinder. It's uh, Cornelia gets Cornelia, killed by sorry. seer. The seer, yeah, yeah, Cornelia. That's it. Sorry, Cornelia's killed. She gets stabbed and thrown, and then double impaled. Yeah. Yes, and again, gory. It's fun. It's fun little gory deaths. Yeah. Um, they're all right. Again, it's budget um, straight to DVD VHS levels of gore here. So I mean, if you're a <laughs> gore hound, you've probably seen better. But um, yeah, so she then tries to escape into the wilderness, but obviously... she tries to get through the the deadlands. Uh, which Stover's like, no, you can't go through there. The radiation, the poisoning, something, something in there will, will stop you. Um, and uh, he ends up collapsing, and then she turns around, he comes back to him, and then he vomits all over her. This massive blood fountain. Oh, yeah, all the... It, it, it's it, all it, of the worms, all, all the, the eggs, all the creatures yeah. that he's been implanted with. Uh, but yeah, you can tell that he's gone completely psycho-crazy at this point. What's wrong, Judy? But then the film kind of does the old switcheroo, where we end up seeing Stover on the crucifix, telling her something. And then before we know it, we're zapped back into the AI and the architect slash seer <laughs> slash Angus Scrim is sat in this computer with this helmet on with all these cables telling her that none of that was kind of real. But it's what you wanted. But it was what you wanted. You wanted to experience outside. And she's like, was that really outside? And he's like, I don't know. I've never been out there. And then he's <laughs> like, no, no, but you passed the test. And... Now you need to take my place, and he obviously reveals at that point it's her father, and it's like you now are the chosen one. You must rule the matrix, <laughs> um, and it's um, it's okay. I mean, it's a it's a it's a fair twist. If we hadn't, I suppose it's worth. This film suffers from us having seen things like the matrix. We are like, yes. oh, oh, they did it so much better, um, and obviously the budget was so much bigger, and the vision was so much clearer and cleaner. Um, and it also did have a real world, where in this particular movie, well, at least they this never one... show us any form of the real world except the bit where they walk around this small box apartment. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that box apartment isn't as horrific as the tubes you have in the Matrix when they woke up in. And uh... I just have to say, at least this film is not as convoluted as the Matrix sequels. Oh, uh, we ignore the Matrix sequels. <laughs> they, they, uh, I'm looking forward to the next one. No. Um, so yeah, but, that, that, and then it... she kind of gets up, and uh, then she wakes up. As if that was all a dream. Right. And she's back in her apartment. Her mum is still alive in the Matrix. And she and we reveal her father's ashes in an urn that was on the side. Over, which she knocked over And before. she had no recollection of. And this is the further kind of darkening. Is the Matrix, shall we say, um, slowly erodes their minds. Which means they forget things like she got her, her mum got her name wrong. She knows her father... But didn't remember... That he had spe- died already. Yeah. Or, that, or but was he? 
Well, yeah, and like, well, you get the feeling that is the real world because you see the goo on the wall. Yeah. And that cylinder has his name and yeah. his date of birth, I think it was 1992 to 2037. Yeah. And the film starts in 2037. So he died yeah. that year. Even, yeah. And they can't remember that. <laughs> and and that's kind of, again, a bit of dark tragedy to the character that she's now accepted the Matrix because it found a way to just trick her into being yeah. at peace. Um, which is a bit unsatisfying yeah it was um, definitely unsatisfying like the the stigma the trope of it was all a dream it wasn't a proper it, it, i mean yeah. it wasn't all but it, it was it was all in the matrix anyway or it, yeah. it, it it's one of those it, it does feel, of, feel leave you feeling unsatisfied yeah the only real bits of the bit which you have a conversation with mom at the end and the bit which she wakes up at the end and you're like yeah. well that's kind of <laughs> it could have been a this is a a kind of it's a TV movie. It's a straight VHS movie. It's it's like an Outer Limits episode it's for sure. For um, sure, it, it could have been so. It, it just didn't feel. Like, I mean, even though we say it was a million to make, it didn't feel like it was worth <laughs> a million. It well, feels... just, did you have any favorite or memorable scenes from the film? I guess all the good bits are in the the kind of tunnels, but. I don't know. The crucifixes were kind of a kind of desolate, frozen hellscape above. Was you know had its moments. The cabin in the woods, as you say, um, with its bunker underneath, almost. Um, and then obviously, like we said, the meat grinder was again the best effects were all in there. Um, multiple deaths that were quite good. Um, most memorable death. Uh, I don't know, probably the opening one with the girl, because it was just so surprising the first time that device just <laughs> turns into pulp and then doesn't affect do the same to wood. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's that 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 was it. It was really yeah. I can, I'm no, again none of it really jumped out at me. I know you appreciate the gore. I'm more neutral on that because it wasn't that good gore to me. Uh, I don't know. I thought the gore was a lot better than I expected from such perhaps, a low budget perhaps. film. But then coming from the KMB effects company, I do expect a certain level of gore that would please me. And so I really liked uh, the the monster cannibals getting disemboweled and guts splashing on the face of the other, the eye gouging, the faucet of blood, the blood bath, the skull blood chalice drinks. Um, I, I thought those were really good. I'll also say the... Um, the, uh, the the scene where Sc- Angus Scrim wants to reproduce with his daughter was fairly disturbing. It was delivered creepily well. Uh, yeah. But uh, of course, like as a fan of Bruce Campbell and Angus Scrim, I just really enjoyed uh, you know Campbell's heroic performance and Angus Scrim's you know frightening and intimidating uh, on screen no, presence. They were both fine. I mean, but the problem inherently is this film kind of undermines it all because it was all a weird dream that didn't mean anything beyond yeah. brainwashing a girl. Which yeah, yeah that's horrible, but she. Just doesn't really suffer now she's just living you know in the now she's the, aware <laughs> yeah she's aware and she rules nothing she's just <laughs> lost in her dreams um, well just do you recommend mind warp not really uh it's a bit inconsequential cruelly put it i mean campbell's library of films is vast and wonderful and there's a lot more interesting things to watch with him in and the same goes for scrim both actors do much better things this film is an interesting oddity, a little bit of an artifact of an experiment by a company that didn't really do very well with it, and this film is apparent why. Because as much as the effects show a gem of where the great men that put those together are going to go and do better things, and again, this is a film about a lot of people who did or do better things from this film. Um, This film is just a crossroads of inconsequential average to subpar <laughs> effects um <clears throat> and i don't hate it but i wouldn't recommend it to anybody particularly because if you're a gore fiend that's much better gore um and if you're looking for a sci-fi dystopia there's much better sci-fi dystopias um and the matrix exists which makes this film unfortunately in every sense unnecessary the sequels to the Matrix, unfortunately, undermine the Matrix, but they don't under, but they do in a sense further undermine the need for this film because they still explore it a lot better. I'm sure a lot more money, tons more money, and I'm not, I'm not gonna argue that. And the Matrix isn't a conventional gore fest horror film. Exactly. So if you're desperate for <laughs> a poor Matrix with a bit of gore, I guess this is for you. And that's, that's a exactly niche. why it's an extreme <laughs> niche. 
I will be recommending Mind Warp, and will do so for many reasons. Namely, Bruce Campbell in a post-apocalyptic universe where he fights underground mutant cannibals and the Tall Man with special effects by the awesome KMB effects group. Yeah, the story has a decent pace, the gore for me was impressive, and there's a lot of great ideas, creativity, and a palpable dread in the atmosphere. Yes, the acting in parts is dreadful, and the dialogue corny, and the characters, well, not all that interesting, but it is good in the sense of at times it's so bad it's good. And also, yes, it was all a you know, bad dream ending, is one of the worst ways to end a story, and it is disappointing to say the least, but it didn't ruin the entire experience for me. The sets ranged from truly amateur to excellent, the music was forgettable, but the explosions and action and gore more than made up for it. It is a low-budget, schlocky sci-fi horror that will please some gore fans and die-hard Bruce Campbell fans, which I am, but if that's not you, then yeah, probably stay the hell away from this one. <laughs> Alas. Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Bye bye now. It would seem frightening at first, but then you'll realize it's everything. <laughs>